Hi, everyone. Uh, like she said, Bears Rebecca Fonte. I'm on the board of directors for Destiny City, um, which is pretty exciting to be able to be on the board of directors to a festival that's on the other side of the country. But I guess that's what we've learned in the pandemic. Nobody has to live anywhere, which is um, really great with the idea of assembling this panel. Um, this is the Right the Fright, Mastering the Horror Genre. I am a horror filmmaker, but I will probably not talk very much today because uh, I have assembled like a dream team here of, of writers uh, and I would like to introduce them to you. So uh, first we've got a writing team of Chris Bavoda and Lee Springer. Uh, and uh, they're responsible for the 2019 uh, genre hit Dead Dicks, which is about uh, it's a brother-sister horror comedy. There's not enough brother-sister horror in the world, really. And uh, this one involves a sister coming to help her brother and then finding that the brother has actually been uh, surrounded by other versions of himself already dead. Uh, very strange premise. Uh, it played my festival um, in Texas, so I got the great luck of meeting them. Um, and uh, our second panelist uh, is Brina Kelly. Brina's uh, first film was The Midnight Man, starring William Forsyth, Vinnie Jones, and Brett Spiner. And her second film, which she wrote and starred in and also produced, is called The Fair, which is basically like a Twilight Zone episode um, of, a, of a taxi ride that goes on and on and on. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, sorry. And my cat is here because I knew this would happen. So hi, welcome to the pandemic. Um, our final panelist, uh, I will have to say, jumped on at the last minute, very much uh, on, in the moment at last night when I when I begged her. Um, so I want you to, to uh, welcome Leah McKendrick. Uh, Leah is uh, responsible for uh, the online musical series, Destroy the Alpha Gammas. Her first feature um, was called Deviant, our first feature was MFA, which played uh, South by Southwest, which is a Me Too Revenge horror film, horror thriller, and then Deviant Love, uh, directed by Michael Pfeiffer in 2019. And although this is not a horror film, she is responsible for writing the upcoming Grease prequel, Summer Loving, um, at Paramount, which is with John August, which is pretty amazing. So um, I, I also want to say Leah is in my first feature, and that's how I got to meet her before she was famous. Um, so I'm very, I'm very lucky. Uh, she's also a really good pop singer, uh, which uh, I don't know, are you still pursuing that? Not that that has anything to do with with horror, but. Um, oh no, I mean, I, <laughs> I, it's like such a dark pass as a pop singer. I, you know, I write a lot of musicals now. I just did, I just worked on Much Ado About Nothing, a present day musical for Sony. So it's really fun that I like use all of, it's almost like I'm choosing, you know, I, I use all of my pop knowledge to write, but like, am I like gonna get in like a bra top and like go get on stage right now? Probably not. <laughs> I, I remember being at a music video premiere of yours uh, 10 years ago. Anyway, all right, so we're here to talk about horror. Um, and as much as uh, being on stage in a bra is as maybe horrific for some of us, um, I am going to start with this question, which I always love to start any of these horror panels with, which is what scares you the most? And I'm just going to let anybody jump in when they think of, but if, if, it's, if there's more than a half second pause, I will call on somebody. So I saw Lee and Chris have, have taken the microphone off. Well, we, we try to actually discuss what scares us the most in our movies. And I think that's why when we wrote Dead Dicks, we were dealing with a lot of mental health issues at the time. Yeah, I was going to say being trapped in my own mind. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> with no um, distractions. <laughs> probably mine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The idea of having another child, I find that very frightening. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Brina? I would have to say, um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I would have to say lack of control. I'm a bit of a control freak. So anytime my agency is completely stripped from me, I find that utterly terrifying. <sighs> I'm sorry. If, if you hear baying, they're, they got gardeners working in the yard today. So I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, it could be some horrific monster just on the other side of that. Door, you never that know. Wall. Yeah. You never know. you never know. So I would have to say that for starters and the dark, really. I'm one of those people who's still a little bit afraid of the dark. Leah? 
I would say what scares me most and and probably what inspired my first feature was toxic masculinity, the patriarchy. Like, I feel like that's pretty central to a lot of what I, what I um, work on. Even I have wrote another horror film about, it's kind of a father daughter drama within the zombie apocalypse. And it's sort of, it's called caregiver. And it's sort of this um, meditation on how they care for us as when we're children and then the cycle changes and we care for them. And we have all this resentment built up towards our fathers. I'm speaking for myself. I'm not going to speak for everybody, but I have all these built up resentments, but it's like our fathers weren't really given the tools, you know, growing up. My dad was born in 55, you know, growing up post-war, like traumatized parents, you know? So to me, it's like, even when I'm trying to create empathy and space for um, men in my scripts, a lot of times it's it's stemming from my own fear of just violent gender politics. Yeah, it feels like now is the time to be most afraid of toxic masculinity. And by the way, anytime we are um, harping, uh, harshing on men, I will call on Chris to defend all men. Um, please he's, please he's, don't. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't realize what he was getting in for um, when I told, asked him to be on this panel. Um, all right, so <laughs> let's uh, so let's just ask how do you how do you start your your scripts when you've got an idea? What is the first thing you do uh, when you sit down to write? Because we've got a lot of writers listening in, um, and I'm sure that they have had ideas and didn't even know where to begin. I'm not a big outliner. I kind of just, I, 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 I can't speak for other writers, but for me, I'll usually get excited because I have like one scene really clear in my head, or I've got one really awesome line, or I've got either, it might be the midpoint. It might be the all is lost moment. And I just believe in like putting whatever, whatever those tidbits are down on the page while it's fresh and magical and sparkly. And then I'll kind of go, okay, what is my, you know, break into two. What is my midpoint? Then I might go and get some of those pieces a little figured out before I start just going willy nilly. But I do believe so much in just whatever you're hot for. Like, don't just like store it, like start like jotting. Brina. <laughs> well, I'm actually, uh, I'm actually quite the opposite. I'm a big outliner. Um, whenever I have an idea, I would think about it and work it um, until I have the entire script pretty much mapped out. So until I have that roadmap, I would put up a big board and I would draw out the entire three acts and, and you know, mark them. And the first thing I would do is I would start to work through every detail and every piece of it so that I know which connects to which connects to which I tend to write. I, I like to write scripts that are very like kind of tightly controlled, I don't know if you notice bears, but um, it, it, you know, like one thing feeds into another and into another. I take a kind of a mathematical approach because I'm Asian, you know? So <laughs> that's what I do. It's, it's I, I, I come up with the entire from beginning to end, every beat, every piece of it. And as I'm going, if something strikes me like a line or a scene, I would go ahead and write that out or I would make <clears throat> detailed notes about it. But usually when I sit down and finally open up final draft and start writing, um, I have the whole thing from beginning to end. It's something that I probably have thought about for a couple of months at that point. And the writing process, usually the first draft takes me about you know, a week or two to, um, to write because at, by by then, by the time I get to the actual writing part, I've I've, I've thought about it so much that you know I, it's pretty much like exists in film form in my head. So that's kind of how I go about it. And then I would take another chunk of time to rewrite it, kind of digest what I have written, and 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 think about it and tweak it and edit it, and then I'll show it to you know other writers who will then give me feedback and, and that'll influence it. But I usually sit with the idea and make sure that it's something that is worth pursuing and something that I have from beginning to end 
thought through and it, it truly is something that that I feel like deserves to be written out and deserves to be made. Um, and I, I take my time with that before I embark upon the actual writing part. Um, I just that's just but that's just me. It's a personal choice. I think for all writers, I like I I'm a linear mathematical minded person. Um, that's always what I gravitated toward when I was in school. So I kind of take screenwriting in those terms as well. And that's just that's just a personal kind of um, <clears throat> uh, style of mine. And it doesn't, you know, it it works for some, it doesn't for others. That's just what I found to be able to, um, that's just what I found works best for me because I feel like it keeps me accountable and it keeps me disciplined in in the whole writing process. Because if I run into a problem, say in act two, I have to solve it before I can start writing. If I if a plot point doesn't make sense or a character is not working, I know that going in. Uh, and I work it until I've solved the, the problem before I ever put it in script form. So that by the time it goes into script form, I've kind of massaged out a lot of those kinks. So that um, it, to me, it's just a way of keeping myself accountable and disciplined as a writer. And I work on it every day. I set aside a dedicated amount of time every day to work on this project if I feel like this is a concept that is worth pursuing. And then sometimes during that process, I realize it's not really worth pursuing. It's not really working. And it's not real or, or that it's not really what I want it to be, or I can't make it work. And that's when I know to move on to another one instead of spending months writing something that doesn't quite work yet. But again, that's just, that's just kind of my process. I think when I started writing, I was much more like Leah and I would just dive in and write. And I got so many films that I got like halfway through the second act or even the third act where it just fell apart. And I was like, Oh, I need to go back now and solve all those problems. And then I have to do a page one rewrite. Um, <laughs> Uh, Lee, this is just, this is just a, a like a maybe for me it's like a time thing you know I'm I'm a big planner I like my day plan like my I have like I, I still write it out in like different color pens because I'm a little bit of a technophobe but I, I'm one of those people who like bullet journals and I like to have my day like planned out so I think it, it comes from I'm like a type A personality I think it comes from from maybe that wait did you just say you write your screenplays out Oh no no no! But like okay. I journal and I I um and 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 I um and I also schedule everything out on like a planner that's still not on the computer. But no, I've managed to uh, actually learn Final Draft, which was kind of a feat in itself. I'm a big technophobe. I'm not I'm not good at uh, technology. I would use a cell phone until it falls apart in my hand before I go get a new one. <laughs> that's just. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I like control. All right. Uh, Lee, Chris, anything to add? Um, How do you start? It's a bit of a hybrid of those. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's convenient. But I, uh, <laughs> I think because we're two people, um, we do a lot of uh, arguing about it uh, beforehand or heated discussions, let's call it. Chris mm -hmm. is generally the the idea guy not always but i mean like if we go back to dead dicks i just pitched what would it be like if a guy got pooped out of a wall and, and then i was like how is that a movie and then we and argued about that for a while and uh then we we often do um what we call a trash draft where you just like no judgment spit it out and sometimes it ends up being like 41 pages mm -hmm. um and most of it useless but Kind oh yeah get it out we find it's like writing is hard but rewriting i guess is easier so if we could just get that first draft out as fast as possible we're going to be rewriting it anyway yeah um, but we do spend a lot of time talking and that is the benefit of having another person in the room all the time is that whenever i have a really bad idea she will let me know right away and so we move on <laughs> if i can't defend why i think something is valuable within the script then we have to let it go. If she can't defend her idea and why it's valuable in the script, we have to let it go. Yeah. And then after that sort of trash thing is out, then we get very old fashioned, even with index cards and really beating it out yeah. a lot of times. But, and rearranging stuff. Yeah. 
Um, I should say, uh, well, I'm paused here. If you you guys listening have questions, you're uh, I think able to drop them into the to, to the chat, and I will see them. And uh, we definitely have planning on leaving some time towards the end to uh, get to questions. Uh, if, if you have them. If you don't, I'll just keep asking questions because I have a lot. So, um, all right. Well, that actually leads really well into my next question, which is for people who are not like write a writing team, I think of writing as such a solitary process. Um, and it's hard to know when something is scary. So how do you know when something is scary? Because it's such a different experience sitting in a movie theater with music and tension. And it's a very different process than reading it on the page. What do you think, Leah? It's a good question because I've been thinking about this a lot watching certain movies. I saw this great, this great movie on Shutter the other day. Did anybody else see it? It was called Martyrs Lane, I believe. And it was like these two. Did you guys watch that? You saw that with the two little girls, right? Yeah. And I and I it, it was just like one little girl. I don't want to ruin anything, but like one a little girl keeps showing up to her window at, at night and she kind of lets this little girl in and you kind of realize they don't even make a real event of it. But it's the second floor window, which I thought was cool that they weren't like, look, it's the second floor. This makes no sense. And so there's these little like they're little playmates and they're playing games and it's getting really weird and dark. And she's like decomposing and it starts taking a turn. And I remember feeling that like nothing in the movie really happened that was like scream worthy or terrifying. But then I finished the movie and I had this kind of darkness surrounding me and I was just a little creeped out. And I thought that's this like slow burn that that creeps up on you throughout the film. And I feel like that to me is my greater goal that I go, I, can, I can't, if, if I'm trying to come up with like a scare here, a scare there, I feel like it, it becomes a little bit um, inorganic. It becomes a little pandering. It becomes a little Hollywood in ways that I just don't write my horror stuff. To me, I'm looking for a more slow burn so that the audience is hopefully, or the reader is hopefully just feeling unsafe, feeling uneasy, feeling like there's something in the room with them or watching them or just getting to them to a place. I think that's why we all love a cabin in the woods, right? Because even when you go with your friends, you're already a little uneasy. You're already a little isolated. You're already, you already have shitty service. All of the, the comforts of your regular life are already kind of compromised. So I feel like for me, I don't like the way that sometimes, you know, in these Hollywood movies they're like set pieces set pieces come up with set pieces come up with set pieces and you're like oh okay I'm gonna just like literally sit here and come up with stupid set pieces that's how I feel a little bit about horror where I'm like I'm not gonna sit here and try to come up with scares I'm gonna try to build a world that in and of itself is scary does that make sense does that answer your question okay yeah absolutely yeah <clears throat> um should I go next yeah sure <laughs> Uh, I, I thought that was kind of like the order that we're going in. If that's okay. Um, uh, there's no, yes. I, I don't know. I think I've been ran. I've been trying to be random, but I didn't know that. The, yeah. For me, um, horror is very personal and it's what scares one person is not going to scare everyone. No, nobody is going to like, nothing is going to work on everybody. So for me, I just, I keep it very personal. I write what scares me. So that's the best advice that I've got. Write what scares you. Write what disturbs you. That deep, dark kind of primal fear that we all have of something. Tap into that. You're never going to scare everyone. But if you write something that is personal, that scares you. First of all, if the audience cares about your character, then they're going to, and if they can identify with that character, which, whichever character or characters that you choose to write about, that is automatically going to be more effective um, for whatever peril or danger you put that character into, the audience has to care. And if you write about things that are personal to you that scare you, you're more likely to create characters that the audience also identifies with because you identify with them and the audience are going to care about them because you care about them. So for me, first and foremost, write what scares you. Personally, for me, isolation scares me. And like I said, lack of agency. So basically being stripped of my autonomy scares me. Being stripped of my independence scares me. 
those things really scare me. Um, and as a minority woman, you know, I, oftentimes I take that part of myself and the thing that scares me and I put them together and I end up writing about, you know, the fair it was all about literal isolation. It was about, you know, two people trapped in a cab that are literally in the middle of nowhere and they keep, and it's, it was a time loop movie and they kept looping that same drive over and over again. And it's that feeling of isolation and loneliness and all you have is each other and, and what they do with that. Um, I have another movie that's coming out this year, um, which is about kind of the struggle between, you know, the male and female traditional gender roles and how that could kind of come ahead to each other. It's about two people on their wedding night. And it's about specifically for me as the, 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 I identify with the female character, just being stripped of kind of my independence and my agency and my sense of self that to me is a very personally terrifying concept. And I usually try to tap into that. I think horror as a genre, one of the reasons why it's such an enduring genre and it's arguably probably the oldest genre in the world, you know, back in hunter gatherer days, cavemen were sitting around campfires telling each other horror stories about monsters that chase them. You know, it's, I think it taps into a very primal need for us as human beings, because as human beings, we live in a world that, um, we have very little control over, and that's terrifying. But horror and uh, watching the horror genre makes us had kind of exercise some control over that unknown, and it gives us agency over our own kind of primal fear, and it gives us the ability to say, um, I'm going to choose when I'm going to be scared and what I'm going to be scared of. And I think that's it fulfills a very psychological need, which is why horror is such an enduring and probably the oldest genre of storytelling. So, but it's always personal. So just write what's personal to you. If, if, um, if, if like me, isolation and, and fear of just loss of control scares you, then think along those lines. If like, you know, exterior forces um, kind of like messing with you, like the boogeyman and stuff like that, if that really gets to you, write um, along those lines, just find something that works for you, because if it works for you, you're more likely to make it work for the audience. Chris and Lee, you guys talked about uh, how you, you know, test out plot back and forth. How did you, is there a way you test out fear back and forth? Scary yeah. moments? I think we do some similar things where it's like really about what we are personally afraid of. Um, and I think sometimes too, we take a look at like the familiar in unfamiliar ways. So you could think like fingernails are pretty normal. Everyone knows what a fingernail is like, but a bag of fingernails is not always the most common <laughs> thing to be around, right? And so I think with body horror and stuff like that, when you take things that are just so familiar and think of new ways of showing them or, you know, like switching them around, it could be very terrifying and very, um, relatable to a lot of people you know like we all age we all grow old and our bodies do things sometimes that go against our wants and desires and so being able to take stuff like that and push it as far as we can go and like understanding how our brain works like working within the genre and talking about subjects like mental health and how we perceive things and how people perceive us yeah i think it's quite along the lines of what brina was saying i think you know I, i'm I don't so much write about what a what would be a scary thing that could happen to this character. I think we tend to write about the things that are our own anxieties, our own preoccupations. Um, and the great thing about genre that is that it really lets you push that all the way to the end um, with a with a without having to respect the conventions of what would really happen in the real world. So you can really use it as as metaphor as a, as a force to sort of take it to 11 what would happen i um, actually to, i'm yeah, sorry i just wanted to say i actually think that's another thing i don't write about it much but body horror is a very very um deeply rooted kind of fear that works on a lot of people which is why it's so uh prevalent in this genre and i think like what you said, like, you know, fingernails aren't scary, but a bag full of fingernails is terrifying. Uh, it 
it reminded me of the image. I don't know if you've ever seen, if anybody's ever seen the image of like a child or a baby skull with all of their adult teeth <laughs> embedded in their jaw. And it's terrifying and it's incredibly disturbing, but we all were like that. And every kid has that. But when you see it, it just really like, it just makes your skin crawl. It's presenting something that is actually natural and normal, but presenting it in a way that disturbs. I think milk teeth really, really is something that disturbs me as an image. And it's just playing around with concepts like that. It's like, what is maybe in nature, but it's something that we can kind of just twist and just make it really, really uncomfortable to look at. I think discomfort is a huge part of what a lot of people find horrific. And um, that's why body horror is such a, is such a huge genre in itself. And that's definitely um, an area that disturbs a lot of people. <laughs> I feel like a good example of what you guys were saying, Lee and Chris, was of the normal, you know, getting pumped up. I love the movie, The Visit of the Grandparents. Have you guys seen that movie? Oh, yeah. it's so awesome. But it kind of takes, you know, all of the kind of weird generational differences between young kids and their grandparents and the ways that their parents tell them, well, they're old. You know, this is kind of what happens. Behavior changes. They get kind of weird when they're old. But then, you know, as we saw, it's, it's darker than that. But I do feel like those kinds of movies that are tethered to actual experiences or, um, you know, real life whatever phenomena is i feel like they get a little deeper yeah um i was trying to think of there's this body horror short that i saw at so many festivals a couple of years ago and it's really about a model and they're like cutting off pieces of her body to like make her look thinner and like oh. basically slicing her it's like the one of the most disturbing things i've ever seen um I, I, yeah, body horror makes me cringe. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so Leah was talking about um, uh, sequences. Uh, what, what, did you, what did you call them? Uh, oh, set pieces. Set pieces, thank you. Yeah, um, you hear a lot of fans and fanboy, fanboy critics, um, which are really just fans, uh, talk about kills and like, you know, oh, this movie had a lot of good kills. And I think when you're doing horror, um, you can't avoid the fact that, that you know, that, that that it's going to be judged a little bit along the fanboy standard. Um, so let so let's just let's just say that you have you have to write a uh, you have to write a good kill. What is the secret to a good kill? Mm. I've been thinking about this a lot because I just saw the new Scream. Well, I saw it the night that it came out, but like I just I'm a huge Scream fan. And great kills in the new Scream, but the one and I don't mean to be critical of any filmmaker because I was I love the movie and I think it's a miracle anytime any movie gets made. So this is just all in good fun and in conversation. But I will say one thing that I missed and one thing that I think makes the original Drew Barrymore opening scene so iconic is the fact that she's her parents are right there and there's a moment where you think she might make it and then there's that final knife in and then scream and you're like this was so brutal this was so tragic this felt so close to going in a different way so to me the if it feels too helpless I think that kills it a little for me. I think I love the edge of my seat. Oh, you're, we're almost there. We're almost there. We're almost there. As opposed to just brutality. And, you know, we're chopping off body parts and it's just a free for all. Like, I love the idea that some of these, they did it in, I know what you did last summer with Sarah Michelle Geller. She's like, there, there's a parade going by and she's kind of limping towards it and we're almost there, we're almost there and then we lose her. So I do, for me, I think it's that anticipation. It's that it's that almost going to get there. What's going to happen if we just know that there's no hope, like the first kill because the person's an asshole and he called a girl a slut. We're like, he's going to die any minute. <laughs> you know, they're like, goodbye. And those are always kind of fun because you, you're like excited to see him die brutally. But I think for me, I want to see that these are smarter people these are faster people. These are people that have a shot at getting away, maybe. Mm. Yeah, I like that. I actually, I, I agree with that. Um, I also love the screen movies. Wes Craven is one of my favorite horror uh, make, filmmakers. And I think it's dangling that anticipation of hope in front of the audience. It's making you think that maybe they'll make it. And then sometimes it's subverting that, uh, that um, 
kind of um, expectation, maybe they do make it. But when they don't, when you dangle that kind of possibility of hope, you're really toying with the audience's emotions. You're making them really feel for the character. And again, kind of like going back to they have to care about the character in order to care about whether that character lives or dies. And I think a good way to make the audience care about the character is to see that character try to survive and maybe even get ahead a little bit, maybe even like, you know, get a punch in or something. Like I always love it when Ghost Face goes down because if you really think about it, he's oftentimes a really clumsy killer. And every time like one of the girls like throws the refrigerator door in his face or like kicks him in the shin and like, yes, you know, like try to survive. And that really makes the audience, it puts the audience in that character's perspective and it really makes them relate to them. So that to me, those are really the best, most effective kills is when you see someone almost make it and then they don't. And you're like, oh, but you almost made it. And you feel like you went through that experience with that character um, because a bloodbath is a bloodbath. And sometimes there are slasher films, uh, especially in more genre, maybe more low budget fair where it's just they're just killing people left and right and it's you get desensitized very quickly and it becomes just you know you're you're, you're just cannon fodder all the, all the characters you, you stop caring you're just kind of watching it for the spectacle of the massacre and i think that's less effective um from a truly horror perspective the other thing is i guess um kind of the creativeness of the kill Every time we watch a horror movie, especially one that's bloody, part of us are watching, um, especially if we're fans of the horror genre, we're watching for the creativeness of the kill. It's almost like a sport onto itself that like, can you surprise a, uh, a seasoned horror reviewer? Like I would see people like critics who specialize in horror say, you know, they really surprised me. Like there were some really creative kills in this one that I, I didn't think of. So I think that's also an aspect of it that people or audiences are, are watching for that they want to see. Um, I think maybe the Saw franchise and the, um, Hostel franchise maybe overdid that a bit. So creative doesn't mean more gory or horrific. Sometimes it's just um, it's just something that you didn't expect that you haven't seen before that stands out to you and that's memorable. Um, I, I agree with that. I, I do think for myself, what scares me most is when um, when I feel safe as a viewer, so, and then it's mm -hmm. unexpected. So for, I mean, is there a better example than the alien chest burster, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. we're in the most lit room we could possibly be in mm -hmm. and we feel safe. We feel now. safe. John Hurt mm -hmm. seems good. Everybody's happy. We're eating and this occurs and it is, I mean, I know of course that the other actors didn't necessarily know exactly what it was going to look like. So the reaction is extremely genuine. Mm -hmm. um, I find for myself, like that kind of unexpected moment. So yeah. we try to, well, we wrote it like a horror comedy, so it's a bit different, but what we, in other scripts, we tried to just play with tension to just pull that moment as long as you possibly can. Um, and I think that already does so mm -hmm. much. And I think there's something to be said too about like, obviously you want to see the asshole die, but if you can somehow, you know, like you take the rug out from under the audience by killing a character that everybody loves really quickly, you know, like, or a character who doesn't deserve it to show like there's uncertainty in death, you know, like a nobody is safe in our world. And, you know, in slasher movies, they, there are tropes we always see and they just get replayed time and time again. And a lot of times, especially during the 80s, when it was just like all about making movies for cheap and it wasn't really about any type of special effects, people were just killing people with knives or guns or whatever. And then every once in a while, a movie like would come out like Hellraiser and it would just push the genre in ways that no one had ever seen before with not just creative kills, but creative practical effects. And that used to be such an important part of the horror genre was how did they create these kills? And now anything is possible with CGI. So you could have, you know, like in the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you know, like removing a person's face isn't as complicated as it was in the 70s when they had to make a prosthetic and make something to try and make it look real, you know, or actually use a corpse to be a corpse. And sometimes um, just the most simple things are so effective. Like mm -hmm. who cannot 
think of like just pick up the sleeping bag and throw it oh, yeah. at the tree. I mean, it's like it's not a it's not an expensive gag, but mm -hmm. it's pretty. I think pretty effective. Yeah, and one of the earliest yeah. shorts I wrote, we had to do a well, we didn't have to, but we chose to do an axe to the head. And I was like, oh, you you know, Friday thirteenth, you always see an axe go like this. Most times you see someone it's their head gets split in half but what if we just put the axe this way and we just lopped the top of the person's head off and that ended up being the whole big set piece of the short film where we had to figure out how to get the top of this guy's head off and the axe came in sideways but that ended up being why a lot of people ended up liking our short film is because we did this kill that a lot of people had never seen before uh, and so sometimes i think if you could just take something that's been done so many times and just find a new way to do it it could be really interesting you know you mentioned um, CGI, and I know that one of the things that um, horror fans really do appreciate is when people go back to using practical effects. You always see that written about, like, oh, this is old school, or like practical monsters and stuff like that, puppets. You know, when you're using when you're using when you're building something actual. Um, but there's also that bit of like, well, when you're writing, are you are you forcing yourself to think about how something can be done? Are you limiting yourself to what's possible um, versus just letting your creativity spill out on the page to do, you know, whatever, whatever you want, you know, somebody's head blowing up and blood flying 40 feet in the air. If you don't have to, if you don't have to know how to do it, you can write anything you want. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on whether or not you only want to be a screenwriter and you would like to sell your script as a um, spec. And, and in which case, go nuts. You don't have to worry about that's someone else's problem, realizing it into uh, into reality. Or if you're more like like someone like me, I'm a writer, producer. And, um, you know, I every film that I write, I intend to produce it myself and see it through to the end. So inevitably, I'm going to end up thinking in terms of like budget, in terms of practicality. You can see it as a hindrance and you can see it as a restriction, or you can see it as an opportunity to really stretch your creative muscles and, and, and see it as part of the problem that you need to solve. Like say you only have a certain budget and you know that if you write the script within this amount of budget, you can get it made. But if you go over it, then its destiny becomes unclear. You don't know if they'll ever see the light of day. So what do you choose? Do you choose to completely stretch your creative muscle to the extent that you can imagine? Because we can always write aliens and monsters and Cthulhu creatures, you know, till the, as you know, as much as we want, but the practicality of that becoming an actual film gets more and more um, unlikely perhaps the the more we pile onto that budget but if you're in a situation where you know you can get this film made if it's just within that budget then don't see it as something that's holding you back see it as an opportunity we all have restrictions that we have to like work within and see it as a way to 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 stretch a different creative muscle make it work the last film that um that i produced which is coming out this year we spent 20% of our budget on practical effects and all of the effects are practical. We fe featured a giant human sized doll which is right here, you know, her face is right, <laughs> right back there. And she's completely prosthetic. It was a build from head to toe. She moved and she was beautiful and it was difficult and, and challenging. But I think the kind of the end result does speak for themselves where no one's going to look at it and think, oh, that's just CG. And I think there is a tactile kind of um, kind of, uh, kind of, uh, relation to a character that you would miss when there's CG where we've all as audiences become so adept at being able to tell what's a practical effect and what's CG. And I think we automatically lose some connection to something when we know that it was just created by a computer. So, you know, just work within your means and do what you have to do to either write your script or get your movie made and don't see anything as holding you back see it as a creative challenge and it could probably push you to do better i want to see the 100k version of something like pacific rim you know i, I think it's called <laughs> atlantic rim i think they make this with a company out there whose entire business model is people renting the the wrong title like next to the real title. Like they do things like, you know, like instead of 
Jurassic Park, they do things like, you know, Cretaceous Park and stuff like that. And it's all their entire base business model is based upon people renting the wrong thing. And then by the time they realize it's the wrong thing, they've already paid the dollar a red box. And it's atrocious, but it's also kind of funny. <laughs> it's the Sharknado people. No, actually, they're not even the Sharknado people. Yeah, it's the, <laughs> the, it's like, the worst in Sharknado. Asylum. Right, it's, yeah. it's the same company. Yeah. It's Asylum. They hey now, there, you know, there's there's skill in making that kind of film too. I, I, yeah, I there's wanna, a market oh, no, for those, like, and as yeah. long as I know the people who made Velociraptor, and that movie was really, uh, it was at Velocipaster. Yeah, yeah, that movie was really successful and good for them. I would have never come up with a concept like that, but you know what? They managed to come up with something that had uh, good. There's an advertising term that they call, um, well, God, what is it? You, you gotta have to come back to me. Um, okay. Oh, it's um, uh, USP. Is I, I hear that thrown around a lot in in advertising. It stands for unique selling point, and Velocipaster has it. It's like Zombievers. That was a, that was a really good one. Zombie Beaver, Zombievers. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, uh, we uh, did get a question here from the audience, which is about. Uh, creating the right balance in a horror victim trope where, where they can be sort of an asshole and therefore like deserve to get killed, but also somebody that is likable that you want to, that you want to watch on screen. How do you, how do you do that balance? Um, well, personally, I think people kind of mistake interesting for likable. I always say your character doesn't have to be likable if he's interesting or if she's interesting. We will watch a character who's interesting and not likable more than we will watch a character who's a doe-eyed do-gooder who's not interesting. And I think the balance oftentimes is make your character interesting to watch. Give them good things to say. Um, you know, I think wit and humor goes a long way for that. And they don't necessarily have to be a good person or even likable or do good deeds for the audience to be on their side and want to go on this journey with them. Um, I, I think much more important than likability for a character is interesting. I think, so, so for me, make your character interesting, make him or her someone that the audience wants to spend time with. And I think also humor goes a long way and in helping with that, I think humor not only diffuses tension in uh, horror in, in the horror genre, but actually, it, I think it serves a much more um, kind of primal um, function. Like usually, I don't know if people notice, but if we jump and something scares us, our natural instinct is to laugh right after that. So horror and humor really go hand in hand, just, you know, on, on a kind of like a primal baseline instinct for us. And I think it's two uh, concepts that work very well together. Uh, for, uh, that's why like horror comedy is one of my favorite genres. And beyond horror comedy, if you look at like, you know, like the screen movies, there's tons of humor in, in them. And it really, it really serves to balance out the horror aspect because if you're watching a horror that's just relentlessly horror horrific and it's kills upon kills and it's constantly horror by the end of it you're going to be exhausted you're going to be emotionally drained but if you watch a, a horror movie that is well balanced like i think cabin in the woods is one of the most well balanced movie horror movies that came out in like the last 10 years get out is also like that that kind of tempers it with a lot of humor and characters who are interesting and have depth and interesting things to say then you're not going to feel exhausted at the end of the experience because you would have had like a well-balanced meal instead of just nothing but steak, you know? Um, us, uh, I'm also thinking about when you create your killers. So, uh, Leah, your movie, MFA, like really centers around, we're, we're in the perspective of the person who ends up being the killer for most of that. And yet we sort of end up cheering for her. How do you, how do, you do that? How do you work that balance? Because that's an interesting version as well. I really am very into like the concept of a villain, like, and specifically female villains, because I think women have been villainized throughout time forever fighting back. And I love a vigilante. I'm always fascinated by, so like one of my projects I did, I did an origin story of poison ivy and I tried to bring some um, empathy towards her. Why does she, become poison ivy where did that happen along in the timeline 
So I think for me, a big thing is about having an empathetic view of every character, not just writing cold blooded sociopaths. Not that that can't be fun, but I think we even see in Silence of the Lambs, arguably the greatest sociopath, greatest serial killer of all time. He had humanity. He had a connection to our to our protagonist. There was something going on between them. If he was just like a cold-blooded monster, I don't know that we could have connected to him and that performance in the same way. And I think that for me is always what I'm trying to do in what regardless of genre. And I and I will say I agree so much with the sentiment that you shared, because I have a character in one of my scripts who's like a terrible guy. He's just a straight, terrible guy. Every time people read it, they go, he's my favorite character. And it's because he's funny. And I think you get so much mileage from a character being a terrible person if they're funny. And I think that people understand that being human and the human experience is laughing and then crying or crying and then laughing or being humiliated and then angry or being angry and then suddenly being sad and it's like we're all a fucking mess being human is a mess nobody is just one thing so I think some of our favorite movies I mean Get Out is so brilliant Get Out is such a, a perfect example of this where the white people are are so cringe and you're like there's something very gross and off but like even in that first remember that scene where he gets they get pulled over and she kind of defends she's like that's bullshit you don't need to see his license we're like we're on her side immediately you know because even though she's white and we're, we're, we're she's saying some cringy things we're also seeing her respond appropriately so it's kind of like just there are there's always this stress of like make your characters consistent and I'm like I'm not consistent as a human I'm supposed to write all my characters perfectly consistent that to me is, it's like, I believe my mode of filmmaking and, and screenwriting is sur surprising ourselves, surprising even me. I feel like, okay, I'm gonna say, the last thing I'm gonna say and I'm gonna shut up. I, one of my favorite lines about screenwriting is, and I do not know who said it, it's somebody much more brilliant than me. No surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader. No tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. So it's almost like, don't think that you are going to fool anybody. It's like you, you are, you can only write, you're only going to surprise people if you're surprising yourself. So I feel like if you're going to write a villain that is just consistently evil, consistently one dimensional, guess what? They're reading and, and being presented as one dimensional. You have to find those intricacies and you have to surprise yourself with it. I will accredit that quote to Mr. Robert Frost. <laughs> I didn't come up with that. Are you sure? <laughs> I did just look it up on Google. I will not say I did not have that on the edge of my brain. That would be insane. Uh, but that is one of the one of the good things about being a host is I can be writing, typing while you all are talking. Uh, love it. <laughs> um, one thing about villains that Lee and I have been talking about recently just because in our next film um it's about an old man with dementia who was once a serial killer and trying to find like a sympathetic side to him but also not forgive him but we talked about how villains are the heroes of their own story and so whenever you you know like i find like in hollywood like thanos is a perfect example of a villain who thinks he's heroic right and so if you go back and you look at all of these characters and in their films from their perspective, what they're doing is not wrong. And so if you can get into the head of your villain and see the film through their perspective and write that character through their perspective, then they are going to be fully fleshed out and they might end up being somewhat likable. That's why people like Hannibal Lecter and stuff like that. Cause he feels like a real person as sadistic as he may be at times he is complex like all of us right well and i mean when you're writing in a way you're you are all of your characters i mean i don't i don't know how you all feel but certainly there's there's parts of you in all of them and mm -hmm. i think that uh, what leah talked about about you know this concept of backstory it doesn't always have to be in it it's something that you can know about your character and we saw with 
when we wrote Dead Dicks, our, we never wrote in the script anything about what had happened to these people who grew up together. But then we saw that our actors went off by themselves and created a whole story of what their childhood was like. They never told us, but brought that to their performance. And so I think, you know, that old exercise where you just take a page and you just write everything you know about this character that may not be in your in your script at all, but it will inform them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's it. Like they're 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 all you. If you mm -hmm. can can you put yourself in all of them and, and then human do they read as humans or do they read as a placeholder? Like no. I think one of the best examples I can think of for um a, the perspective of what's um, traditionally a villain character, but told from that character is a movie called Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. Uh, it's tragically like not a lot of people know about it. I will recommend it and push it to the day I die to anybody who will listen. It's it's so good. It's one of the best examples I can think of uh, that was, you know, recent that uh, basically that presented a, a traditional horror film, but in the perspective of the killer and it made him funny and he had heart and, and you understood him, but he was a serial killer and he was this guy preparing to become a serial killer. And the movie's kind of told in a documentary style following him. And it's, it's just so well done and so brilliant that um, those people deserve um, way more of a career than unfortunately they have so far and please go see that film please go see behind the mask the rise of leslie vernon it's it's so so good did did anybody see um my friend my friend Dahmer? because oh. that is another example of a movie where you're like yes. i almost get it but i ooh, i don't want to get it but i, I read the but he's interesting that. yeah. <laughs> and that's what makes the difference well, he, like the problem with Dahmer is a he's a real person. He's a real person, people, so that's good. Cool, interacted yeah. with him. He had friends, you know. Like if you read the graphic novel of my friend Dahmer, yeah. it's way more complex than the movie, and it is. It's like you don't know how to feel after yeah. you read this book. You really don't know how to feel about this man. Which I think is great because I think the the comic is written from the perspective of a man who really of a young a man who really knew him and really grew up with him in the school and and he was, you know, he was so freaked out by having been close with him and not having known and and I feel like all those kind of weird feelings are really in the in the work there's mm -hmm. like these old yearbook pictures where they jokingly they put Jeffrey Dahmer in every single club which he wasn't in as like a gag and they thought oh this is so funny and then now of course in this yearbook <laughs> that still exists well, no what's even crazier about that <laughs> is because they were on the yearbook community they put Jeffrey Dahmer in every single photo and the teachers crossed his face out. And so yeah. in the yearbook, there's all of these pictures Oof. with Jeffrey Dahmer's face crossed yeah. out, printed that it's way. Like like chilling. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> it's it's crazy creepy. Thing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime you deal with something that was real, it adds a, just an extra layer of, of, of something of creepiness. Every time you see the based on true events, no matter how much liberty they take, there's there's a special kind of layer of horror that you tap into just because the thought of this having actually occurred because it, it kind of goes back to like, like film and the horror genre gives us agency over real world horror that we have no, you know, that we have no control over. Like, you know, one of Russia's nukes can wipe us out tomorrow. I live in LA and I think about that all the time. <laughs> and there's nothing we can do about that. Earthquakes being another thing. You know, I mean, you could move to Iowa. I could. <laughs> But uh, or Nebraska or something. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, but so I mean, we only have anyway. a few more minutes. We only have a few more minutes left. So I want to end with with one final question for everybody, um, because I, you know if you're inspired right now, I'm I'm totally inspired to to you know write another script. Um, listening to everybody, but I'm curious when you guys want inspiration, uh, is there is there a film that you go to for inspiration, or is there a film that inspired you along the way? Give somebody, we already heard, you know, one from Brina already, but but give us a give us a movie that you think people should check out as a great example of horror writing. Mm. Uh, uh, it's hard to, I mean, a great, I think one of uh, the Wicker Man to me is a really wonderful, film it's uh always surprising i think 
it it's it's got a lot of like on on paper this shouldn't be frightening but somehow the execution of this is so creepy it's a horror place so much of it takes place in the day i guess i have a thing with uh, the the light but um yeah I, for, I think that's a wonderful film. For myself, though, if I feel stuck, I try sometimes to not to, to get inspiration from something that isn't a movie. So go to the museum, um, go for a walk. I try to kind of think about other other kinds yeah. of, of art and that sometimes will shake something loose. Well, when I was younger, I read a lot of comic books. I read a lot of Stephen King and then I read a lot of Clive Barker. And when Clive Barker started making movies, it really blew me away because I felt like nothing like that was coming out at that time. So Hellraiser and Nightbreed really kind of, I think, imprinted on me uh, as a kid. And so it was like monsters that could be terrifying, but also th sympathetic. And so that idea of sympathizing with a monster, whether it's a human monster or an actual like creature of the dark or something like that, I've always thought of stuff like that as being very influential. Um, but I also agree with Lee, like sometimes you got to get away from the genre to really be able to do something new in the genre. Because if you're just watching horror movies to make a new horror movie, you're really probably going to pick a lot of those tropes from those other films. So going back, we've been watching like a bunch of the Criterion stuff lately, going back to the 50s and 60s to try and take some of those classic characters and those classic conflicts and see how we could reimagine them. Yeah, that's cool. Um, one of my top five favorite movies of all time um, is is The Orphanage, which is a Spanish film. Guillermo del Toro oh, yes. produced yeah. it. But I like think about this so often. I could literally do a TED talk on this one concept because I think about it all the time. And I always try to tell people about it. And people are like, don't care. So horror, you horror people are going to get this. But one of, I love a ghost story so much. And there they follow a pretty simple storyline, right? family or chick or dude, whatever, a group of people move into a house, weird things start happening. Usually the wife is like, there's something in this house. And then we have the debate of no woman, you're crazy. And I get so, or, or child, no little child, you're crazy. And I hate that debate because I always feel like we are all here because we know that there are ghosts in this house. We wouldn't have bought the ticket if there weren't ghosts in this house. And what the orphanage does which I think is so, so, so brilliant is that it's not about the ghosts in the house. That they go, maybe there's ghosts. It doesn't matter, where is our child? That is what the movie is about, is about their son going missing and he has HIV and he needs his medication. And every day that they do, don't know where he is, the clock is ticking, he could be dying and they are running out of ways to, to figure out where he is. They have this nationwide search and it comes down to, I have to, there's something in this house, I have to communicate, but it does, it's beside the point, whether it's haunted, whether they're good ghosts or bad ghosts or who the fuck cares, where is my son? And I feel like it's so brilliant that we don't try to point a finger and have this drawn out debate about whether ghosts exist or not, because I think we are all suspending that disbelief in order to enjoy the film. And I'm just, I just think it's, it's one of the tropes I would like to do away with in ghost stories that we call somebody crazy. Guillermo did the same thing in Crimson Peak, uh, his uh, 2015 film. He loves doing that. He basically puts you in a world where fantastical things exist, but it's the humans that cause the real pain. And it's the drama and relationships between humans that is more horrific than any of the stuff going on around that. And, and I, I think that's such a brilliant, fresh take on things. And uh, I agree with everybody. Watch what speaks to you, no matter what genre it is. My last film with the doll in it, uh, it was inspired by me watching Moulin Rouge, which is one of my favorite films. And I was just watching it one day and I thought, and it, I just had the idea because I was looking at how that movie pre represented relationships in these big dramatic ways. And I thought that could work in horror. Why can't horror be presented like that? So I set about making a Moulin Rouge horror film. So, you know, watch, read, look at and experience what speaks to you and inspiration will come. And if you, yeah, if you want to work in the horror genre, that doesn't mean you have to exclusively restrict yourself to that because if you do, then you end up copying something and emulating some, someone else as opposed to being true to yourself and your own voice. Yeah. I love watching movies like 
romance movies or drama movies and, and thinking to myself, what's the, what's the horror version of this? Or what's the science fiction version of this? Sometimes I'll, I'll write, uh, I'll outline a story that I was like, well, I would never write this because it's not actually in my genre. And then I'll be like, all right, well, I've got a plot though. So what is the horror movie version of this? And um, I, I, that find that seems really eye opening. So, well, um, I really want to thank all of you for being here. Um, you guys are fantastic. This has been really inspiring and uh, I really appreciate your time. And I hope everybody who is watching has come away with some good tips. And, and, you know, when you make your horror film and it gets famous, you can say, well, you know, when I was at the Destiny City Film Festival, uh, I saw this great panel and it really inspired me. And then, and then we'll all feel special. Um, but I hope you guys, everybody watching enjoys uh, the movies this weekend. Thank you for Destiny. Thank you to Destiny City for having us. And thank you to our panelists for being a part of this. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.